Hello and welcome to the Excuse Buster Show where we break through the things that can get in your way of feeling how you want to feel and living the life you want to live. I'm Lizzie Williamson and if loss or your approach to life is holding you back in some way then you want to stay tuned to this episode because my guest today knows a lot about harnessing your own experience and living life to the fullest. She lives and breathes her message of legacy and life as she travels the world as a executive coach, a sought after speaker, and with the documentary, the extraordinary documentary that is, shows, shares the journey of love, life and loss of her beautiful husband, Andy. And this is Vashti Whitfield. Hello, Hello, lovely to have you here. So good to be here. When I watched that documentary, Be Here Now, which is on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Now, it is so incredibly moving, profound and a mm. massive congratulations mm. for Thank putting you. that out there. Thank you. When I was reading your, another extraordinary piece of writing, your book, Spartacus and Me, at the end of the book, you talk about when you were at a Q&A screening of yeah. the doco and a woman in the audience asked you a question, which I would imagine you get asked a lot, which is how do you continue to live life with a positive outlook mm. after all that you have lost? Mm. And you went to answer it away, and, but instead you answered it in another way. Remember that? Oh, you put me on the spot now. So we wanted to go really a simple, you know, well, you just live life to the, yeah. the full, you do your best. Yeah. But I would imagine you answered her in a way that you would answer someone now if they asked you that question. Look, and it's a really interesting one because I find that you can't be contrived when people ask you these certain things. Mm. And the way that I operate, and one of the reasons we called the documentary Be Here Now, is all you really have is the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Now, like in this moment. So my response to your question is, is it's about the fact that in the moment of whatever you're going through, you've got to acknowledge how you feel mm -hmm. and you've got to acknowledge what you're potentially losing or afraid of losing because otherwise we suppress the feeling of grief mm -hmm. and to allow yourself to, to move on to what's possible you have to experience grief. It's a part of something we ignore in our culture, right? We all mm -hmm. experience loss on a daily basis in different ways. Um, it can be a loss of identity, it can be loss of a job, it can be loss of a certain body type after having a baby, whatever it is, it can be huge. It can be losing your family. So you have to experience what you're going through and allow yourself to experience that. And then it's about what now? Mm. So. I've allowed myself to feel that, but what does this opportunity offer up right now? Mm. And so that's really, for me, when people ask me that question um, at any given stage, it, it does change, mm. but it will always come back to the same generic mindset of acknowledge your feelings, but actually look to what does this give you and not take away from you. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Do you need glasses when you read? No. Okay, then I think you have a read of what you said. That's because it just gives me goosebumps. Um, Am I going to read it? You're going to read it. What you turned to the lady in the audience and said. So I turned back to the lady in the audience and um, the trick is, is about choosing to view everything in life as an opportunity. The good, the bad, and definitely the sometimes downright ugly. And even more than ugly, you know, terrifying and sad. Mm -hmm. It's how you choose to see those things that you either embrace them and or run away from them. Mm -hmm. And I always echo the point that life and everything and everyone coming and going happens for you as an opportunity and not to you. Mm, yeah. My, our mutual friend, Give that back Sarah, to you. first met you when you were at, she walked into a cafe in Paddington and you were there as well. She hadn't met you before, but she said hello. And I know you're someone who likes to say hello. To and everyone. To people I say hello well. to everyone. And she's like yeah. that as well. Like, hello, how are you? And, and you said, oh, my husband died a week ago. What has loss taught you? Um, loss has taught me so many things. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd need probably a 12 month series to go through all of that. One of the biggest and most profound things loss has taught me and the journey in, in losing someone, but then losing an identity and then the continuum of 
that loss in your life, mm. whether it's the bereavement of a father figure or a father like it was Father's Day very recently, mm. somebody present in your kid's life to represent that, or just the sheer fact of a loss of identity because you've had to become so much. But I, there's kind of three answers. The first thing, loss taught me that you should never ever, or I'm gonna own it for myself, uh -huh. one should never ever, through their own fear, get in the way of another's journey. And so when I talk about that, for all of those that have been touched by someone or going through the experience of cancer or another very challenging terminal potential illness, is that often we want that person to do what we think is right that will it somehow enable us to feel safe or better. Mm -hmm. You know, they want them to do the chemo or they want them to drink the juices or they want them to be... And that's our fear mm. for losing them. So for me, it was all about not only with my late husband, Andy, to get out of his journey by stopping him with my fear, but also now watching my two kids mm. to not get in the way of their lives. Let them experience all those things that they're supposed to experience and not pad them out, if you like, with my fear mm. and get in the way of their journey. So that's what loss has taught me primarily and it's mm. a phenomenal lesson. It's mm. like a cornerstone to my parenting as well. Um, the other thing that loss has taught me is it's this remarkable duality of, of it sounds like a contradiction, I call it the duality of presence. Mm -hmm. So in one moment I can be here with you, and I've spoken about this many times before, but at the same time there's this sense of the experience with Andy and experiencing his loss and our loss and him dying it's it's the time of year now where it's very evocative because it's coming up to his anniversary mm. which you may or may not know mm. and um, it will be nearly seven years and so there's this duality of this time of year and thinking about what I was going through I can feel it you know mm. I can feel this mm. sense of getting ready to let him go so having that at the same time as being here talking to you mm. or as something else going on, it just gives you this constant presence of what is and isn't important. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And so it's a bit like, I think of it like an old school film, you know, where they like, used to flicker. It's almost like cine film. Mm. It's always there. And again, I talk about this all the time. So that has taught me to always put things in perspective always let yourself feel the feelings blow up be sad frustrated whatever but then you get really clear around like nothing is that big a deal mm. and then the third and final piece that loss has taught me is that we get so caught up particularly in our younger years and even though i'm you know i'm 45 now i still consider that the younger years of there's still that thing, and I don't know if you do it, where you go, by the time I'm 30, I'll have this and I'll be here. Oh, by yeah. the time I'm 40, I'll have this. Yeah. By the time I'm 50 or 40, blah, 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 right? And having sat with somebody who's had to say goodbye to their babies, mm. like literally say goodbye to their children for the last time, and have had two very special people in my life die under the age of 40, what it's given me now is this sense of not by the time I'm 50, I will be this and I will have this kind of body and I will have this kind of success it's more about by the time I'm 50 what do I want to experience in life and what do I want to give back to mm. honor being here mm. and that's what it's taught me to look at age and time and life in a very different way of what's possible instead of what do you have to achieve to feed some kind of sense of ego or security uh, social mm. status or whatever so there are the three key things. So it's what I want to experience rather than what I want to be. What do I want mm. to experience, but also what do I want to give back? Give back, yeah. Because I think about life as legacy, right? Mm. So life is your legacy. How you're choosing to show up and be here and give back in the way you're doing it as you mm. is your legacy. Mm. How you're, you know, we just spoke about your book mm. and how we have these expectations of what we want and because we're so excited, we always expect them to happen. Mm. And they don't always turn out, you know, as I'm an absolute demonstration of the way we plan. Mm -hmm. But what we get in replacement of that is so key. So going back to that point, it's like, what do I want to give to this life and what do I want to receive from it and how can I focus more on that instead of the fear of living up to some kind of expectation mm. was that in your mind and in the decision to make the documentaries to be able to be so so vulnerable and so giving it's like it this was it did it feel like a, a gift 
that you could give people? Because I'm sure a lot of people would look at that documentary because it's so, you, you, we're so there with you and yeah. you think, I'm not, I wonder if I could actually do that. I wonder if I could have the, the cameras there. Yeah. I, look, it, the film is called Be Here Now. And, mm. and for me, even the whole kind of proviso that I work under now is Be Here Now with me. Mm. Okay? Because as I always say, all you've really got is the now. So when we were making the documentary, it was a commitment. Mm. And I also look at life in a way of, you're, you know, you're either committed to something or you're attached to the fear of something else, the fear of it not happening, the fear of not having enough, the fear of, right? Mm. So when we committed to the documentary, there was no, it was a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. We were in it because it gave purpose, not knowing what the outcome will be, not knowing how the documentary would turn out, when it would come out. We didn't think about any of that. We just committed to the documentary and it being a vehicle to give Andy's experience, our experience, purpose, mm -hmm. and that purpose being at some point we trusted it would give back to people in a way that would can create more of a conscious, collective hub of human beings that felt supported in some way, mm -hmm. right? Or were inspired to live life more passionately. So the second part of your question is, I don't know if I would be able to have cameras, did you know, we were when you're in an experience like that as so many of you will know and you may even know you don't think about tomorrow often you're just thinking about today and how will we get through today or how will you get through the night for andy mm. towards the end in terms of pain for me as a potentially solo parent it was how do i love and nurture all these three people in the way they need to be nurtured today so there was no thought about the documentary and what it would come or whatever. It mm -hmm. just was a part of the journey, like mm -hmm. going to see a doctor or going to see a therapist to help. It was a part of the process that we had committed to and signed up for. Mm. So after people have watched it, what do you hear the most that they say to you or they've written to you? Well, I would say on average I get between you know 50 to 100 messages and people trying to connect often weekly mm. and they they're varying different things there are people who thank us I call it us because I always include Andy mm. in that and Lily but Foster the incredible director mm. um, and even the Cubs Jesse and Indy because they as they evolve and grow they've become a part of it even more ironically mm. people that have been through it lost a father lost a brother uh, lost a child even a child not through illness but through suicide mm. will just say thank you to acknowledge the uh, and I'm sorry to use this word again but the journey mm. it's very hard to describe so much of what you see in the film it's almost impossible to describe to another human being how that feels mm. so people will write and say thank you for creating something that I can share with other people so they understand and so it just gives understanding to something that unless you're going through it, you can't. Mm. So there's enormous gratitude there, but just also this sense of, I'm not alone. Mm. So I'm reaching out to you to say thank you for doing this, to acknowledge my experience, mm. whether they're the carer. Mm. So many people you know, that care for don't have a voice or don't know how to have a voice because it sometimes seems self-indulgent when this person yeah. that you love is going through so much pain and is ultimately going to die mm. so it's about giving a voice to those and also the outer family who often aren't included or those outer friends that all of a sudden when this happens even though there's a rich friendship fall away mm. so they get to voice how they feel as well through the documentary mm. and I think probably lastly um, which has been hugely significant and I've been traveling around the world doing a lot of speaking is with um, palliative care and medical staff Mm. who work all the time in the what's called end of life space where they're nurturing looking after terminally ill patients and their family and the people looking after them and it's been this incredible tool to uh, allow them to watch it and then where I come in is I then go and facilitate them in how to speak to care for coach facilitate people in hospitals and also the family because when you're caught up in that world often you become desensitized to what's mm. actually going on so that's where there's been enormous thanks from often palliative care um, 
private and public hospitals going thank you for making this because now we understand and we can teach how to do it differently and i guess they can also see that importance of, of legacy yeah as well oh, absolutely mm -hmm. yeah and on the, the conversation of legacy um i was speaking last week with a, 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 a an organization talking and they somebody had watched the film mm. and so this was what happens somebody watches the film and they go oh <gasps> Because there's this like incredibly sexy, beautiful, six pack, loincloth bloke mm -hmm. who just seems like, well, not like half the guys in the office. They wish it was like half the guys <laughs> in the office, but just seems like somebody they knew. Mm. They watched the Spartacus show, so they connected with it. And then they've watched the documentary and so they've been hugely moved by it. So they'll walk into the head of, you know, learning development or the head of marketing or, you know, the head of um, high potential leadership and they'll go, we need to get people motivated to be at work. Mm -hmm. We need to get people passionate about why they're here and what their purpose is in the workplace. So then what they do is they bring me in to talk about legacy where I actually show the film. Mm -hmm. And without even having to say too much, we use snippets of the film to allow people, going back to your original question, to get this sense of life and death and how there's such a short space in between for living. Mm -hmm. So it empowers them and inspires them to look at the concept of their life and their legacy and how they can do that just in their day to day. Mm. Purpose is something I've heard you say and write about yeah. a lot as well. Some people feel like they've, they've got their purpose, yeah. I think, and other people feel like, oh, I don't know what, yeah. my, what my purpose is. Yeah. How do you help people get to that place where they can find that yeah. purpose, that yeah. sense of purpose. Yeah. Look, purpose is one of those words that scares people. Yeah, right? totally. There's, there's the words like purpose and passion, mm -hmm. and people just go, oh no, I don't, I don't, have, a, I don't have a purpose, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How I define purpose is finding meaning. Mm. You don't have to run away, leave your job, leave your husband, leave your children. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a terminal illness. Purpose is about giving meaning something. And often things in our life have um, a meaning which it doesn't inspire, us, inspire mm. us. So for example, the meaning of work is to provide. You know, the meaning of my job is so that I can get a paycheck, right? Which is important mm. because we need those things. But if I can bring meaning to it, that actually makes me feel like I am honoring some of my values, mm. making a difference to another person, um, finding creativity and, and kind of loving something about it, I'm bringing meaning to it. Mm. So purpose doesn't have to always be this hugely altruistic, um, I'm going to go and join Medicine to Frontier, which you could do, huge thing. It is about how can I find meaning or bring meaning to what I do? and. For me, meaning is about how can I make a difference to others. Mm. And that doesn't always have to be in this hugely profound way. Mm. It could be in making a beautiful salad for someone. Mm. You know, as someone that chose to honor their partner's career as a commitment to the big picture for us both and be a really nurturing, committed, stay-at-home mummy, which had all sorts of challenges to it for me, mm. choosing to make things and do things with the kids gave it meaning. Mm. So purpose to me is about how do you find meaning in whatever it is you're doing? And if you're not sure what that is or how to find that, it's also about being unattached to going on a bit of journey of discovery, mm. you know? And that's something people are frightened of. They expect they should know exactly what it is straight mm. away. So my short, long version is, purpose is always about finding meaning in something. And, and that can often be in some of the biggest, darkest challenges as well. If you can find meaning and purpose in them, they have a second breath of life breathe back into them. They become something else. It feels like it's so tied together, the, the purpose and the be here now mm. idea. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you're, you're in there, you're experiencing something, you're much more likely, mm. I suppose, to be able to find that that meaning because so often we just like oh you just do it you do it you go to work come home we don't actually sort of look at it's what you're saying life happens for you rather than to you mm. Mm. well it's an interesting one um 
obviously for for the older folk and for those that are into um, the more kind of esoteric uh, conversation, Be Here Now first kind of came in as a language through Ram Dass. And that was a time where, you know, in, in those years, it was all about kind of success and acquisition and status. And they found a way being through, you know, again, through meditation, through other um, avenues, a way of being present and the richness of being present in life. Cut forward to being sat in a restaurant wondering whether or not you were going to get the uh, diagnosis that you were potentially terminally ill again and or you were going to begin this amazing new chapter of shooting another incredible TV series. Be here now for us men, whatever is going on in your life, wherever you are, whether you're sitting in Sydney, Australia, talking to a gorgeous human being, or whether you are potentially about to be told that your beautiful small child, as a friend of mine, is going through, is terminally ill. Mm. It's, if you be in the moment of now, you get out of your head. Mm. And you get out of all of those self-limiting beliefs, the, the interference, the ego, the fear, all of that stuff. And you just come into now. And when you step into now, all of a sudden this brilliant thing happens, which is completely synonymous with what creativity is. The definition of create, creativity, is to create something from nothing. Mm. So if you come into be here now and that philosophy, whether you're talking about in a moment of an executive coaching session, whether you're talking about um, choosing, you know, a really big decision that you've got to make, worrying too much about the future or the past doesn't allow you to create in the moment. Mm. So it's all about be in the moment, leverage off, no fear of the future, no fear of the past, what is possible now. Mm. So what is it that you do to practice that? Well, I'm very fortunate in that um, I have always had this, you know, insane curiosity for life. You, like, it's extraordinary, like, it's quite, you want to live and you live an extraordinary life. Is that how you well, des- describe? I, know, I, I, I love, know. I love the word extraordinary, yeah. right? Because extraordinary, quite obviously, this is no rocket science, I love that one, brain surgery, rocket science going on right now, extraordinary, mm. right? It's about taking the ordinary and packing it full of extra. Mm. So it can be sitting in the garden. I've just, I've just left a really huge, um, working relationship that I was in which meant I had so little time and what I realized the gift of that you know multiple gifts but the biggest thing was stepping away from that was just having time again Mm. so my daughter has this absolute passion for guinea pigs and so recently just staying in the garden and watching her hang out with her guinea pigs while Mm. I take these little videos and then overlay these really hilarious profound meaningful conversations so it looks like the guinea pigs are talking about you know <laughs> the meaning of life that you start an instagram page it's it? gonna she's okay. gonna do it <laughs> that is extraordinary mm. because most people don't get that time mm. or they don't take that time mm. so it's it's about the fact there's massive freedom to make extraordinary things happen if you lean into the moment mm. but the other thing for me is about you know anything is possible which is why I found recently more than anything, people come to me to be coached because they're like, people have told me that this not not possible, but seeing what you did with your husband and then seeing what you did and turned death into, I kind of feel like if I hang out with you, anything's possible. Mm. So for me, it's about exploration, curiosity, some really clear plans and steps, right? Mm. We need to use the brilliant capacity we have with our brains Mm. to clarify where we want to go and then work out how to do them. Mm. We may as well use our brilliant brains, but then also to not get stopped and blocked by, you know, sometimes things don't happen in the way that we want to or in the timing. So look Mm. for the opportunity in learning in that. Mm. So again, it's all about Instead of playing life really ordinary, being beaten, giving up, feeling insecure, be extraordinary and keep stepping back up and going, what's next? Yeah. You know, what's possible? 
packing the extra into the ordinary. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, so good. That's you know, that's what Oprah would say: tweetable moment. A tweetable moment. <laughs> There's always a tweetable. Moment. And got, you know, wonderful Oprah, who who I sat with my nearly 11 year old daughter the other day in our favorite bookstore around the corner, where Andy and I, in fact, got married. And there's this fantastic series of books about extraordinary women and extraordinary men that have come mm. out and they're, they're packaged in a way that uh, educate our young as to who these incredible people were that have literally paved the way for them to lead such liberating and free lives. And one of the books was about Rosa Parks. Another was about um, oh, all sorts of incredible women, Frida mm. Kahlo. Um, and then one was about Oprah. And my daughter, I'm sorry, Oprah, she said, who's Oprah? Because I realized, you know, she's that next generation mm -hmm. and we don't really watch TV. We mm -hmm. just watch, you know, really great kind of HBO-y kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so it was really interesting, again, the concept of legacy, talking to her, not about a TV show, but this extraordinary woman and mm -hmm. human beings that were, that who they chose to be, how they chose to give back, how they chose to lean into adversity and challenge mm. to make a difference is what legacy is all about. Mm. And again, those little moments, you know, taking a moment like a question like who's Oprah, instead of going, why don't you know who she is, leaning into the moment of what's possible to teach my daughter here. Mm. And you're also a bit of an exerciser. I am, although I found myself this morning at 5.15 at my favorite uh, coffee place, the Republic Bakery in Bondi, someone saying, are you exercising this morning? And I was like, that word. I know. So for me, I... You're a mover. I'm a, I <laughs> like to move. I hate the word exercise too. I, sometimes I wish you just did that word did yeah. not exist because yeah. you say exercise to someone like, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's punishment. Like, it's like for some people, the words giving up smoking or being debt free, the focus point on the doing for some people has resistance. Mm. I've always been um, an energy junkie. Mm. I've got more energy than most rugby teams, uh, most human beings. And so I have to do something with that. Uh, otherwise God help the world and my children um, for me it's changed dramatically since Andy's illness and his death for me now I have a very different relationship with my body mm. and so what that means is instead of punishing it and telling it that it's not quite right I mean we do go through that game every day my mind and me you know mm. like oh yeah. my god look at your bum it's not yeah, where it should yeah, be yeah, or, we all know well. oh look at the look at the angle of this you know yeah. like everybody I've got really strong quads they just look <laughs> I, I what I what I want to say is my relationship now is more about flow mm. I my brain works at its best my body works at its best I work at my best emotionally, hormonally, when there's really consistent flow mm. um, and watching somebody lose the ability to use their body. And mm. even when I wasn't even conscious of that being a thought, when with my second pregnancy, Indy sat like a watermelon really heavy and, and not in the way that I was like this perfect little pregnant lady running up and down the beach with Jessie. I, could bear, I couldn't move towards the end. It was really uncomfortable. And I remember thinking, the moment this little one pops out, I will never, ever, ever not make the choice to go for a run, a walk, anything. Just mm. always take advantage of it. Mm. And so for me, when people say every morning, God, you're good getting up and doing mm -hmm. that. It's not about good or bad or it's like, I literally can't wait. Like it's, I wake up early in the summer months, like four o'clock excited because I can't wait to go for a run on the beach. Mm. And that sounds ridiculous and people think I'm, I'm talking BS there, but it is something I just love. And, and again, you know, I'm in my mid forties, I pushed my body really hard its whole life. Yeah. We've worked really well as a partnership, so I need to be grateful, but I'm also conscious of knees and little little things starting to be there. So I kind of go, all right, I've probably got, if I'm really lucky, five years or whatever of this kind of movement. Uh -huh. And then I need to be conscious of where I need to move into that. Mm. So instead of treating my body like it's supposed to do what I tell it, we work much more as a partnership now and, and, and listen to each other's needs. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's fun. I it's like lots that. of fun. Mm, yeah. And you love your sunrises? I, I think sunrise, for me, more than anything, is a part of mental health mm. and a greater, bigger, broader connection. You know, when you have the privilege, as I do, to see the ocean every day and the sun coming up, 
it just puts everything into context and it also gives you such a great perspective on how tiny you are mm -hmm. you know the, the the ocean is such a vast mass and then you see this giant ball of sun and i i get to also watch all these other people that just stop and they, they might be taking a photo yeah. <laughs> everywhere, but there's also a lot of people where I live that just stand there and the mm. surfers that are out that just watch it. And it just resets and refreshes every single day. And it's at the beginning of the day, right? Mm. So it's that point where you go, new beginning, what can I do with today? Mm. Yeah. So what do you want your legacy to be? I think, obviously, the biggest legacy for me is allowing Jesse and Indy, my two beautiful children, to be open to what and who they're capable of being and giving mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. So my greatest work will be to equip them with the tools to just observe themselves, to utilize their best selves and to not judge themselves too harshly. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably my number one because mm -hmm. then they'll use their time here wisely and, and also just not sweat the small stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like so much pressure on everyone to do well at school, to do well at this, but like, just remember you don't know how long you get. So teaching Jesse and Indy to enjoy the ups and downs of life and to think of it as a whole and not one part of it being the definitive of who they are. Mm -hmm. And the other part of the legacy that I'd like to leave behind is just about, I read this quote that I loved and some of you who follow me will have already seen me reference it, which is be so authentically yourself that you make everybody else feel safe to be themselves too. Mm. And so in the messy way that I do it, uh, you know, sometimes stumbling like a drunk person <laughs> through the dark in the way I do things from what I start and don't finish, um, to my hilarious spelling and grammar. It's about find, you know, the legacy I want to leave is in to inspire people to lean into who they are and whatever life is throwing up and just to experience it, you know, mm. to the richest and to the fullest. And that's the legacy I'd like to leave behind. And my absolutely inappropriate sense of humor, which I won't share today. <laughs> Thank you so much My pleasure. for being here. We're all very, very fortunate to have you and this legacy and those kiddies of you, yours are very fortunate too. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very you much. much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so <laughs> much. Ending with a cuddle. I know, a big cuss and uh, bye to everybody. Bye to everybody. Thank you so much for watching. We'd love to hear from you in the comments what resonated with you from what Vashti has had to say. If there's something there, you're like, yes, I'm gonna, I need to start that, or I wanna have that change of mindset. Let us know there and share, and we'll continue the conversation. If you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, share away so that you can get this message out to your loved ones. And if you'd like this episode or future episodes of the Excuse Buster Show into your inbox, then head to twominutemoves.com forward slash live TV and I shall send that out to you. Thank you again for taking the time for you to watch this extraordinary woman and all she has to say. Bye. Oh, I wish See this you. didn't have to end. <laughs> <laughs>